Hello everyone, an enormously warm welcome to today's reading. My name is Helen Eastman, I'm the Director of Live Canon and also an Associate Artist of the APGRD and on the advisory board there, so it's a double pleasure to get to welcome you with both of my hats on today. This is the third in this reading series, which looks at emerging uh, work from poets which explores the classical and responds to classical mythology or classical literature. Um, some of the work we're going to hear today is published work, some of it is work in progress, and as always, we're incredibly grateful to the poets for sharing their work with us. I always find these readings incredibly inspiring and um, they set my brain frizzing with a million uh, ideas. For many of us who spend a lot of time responding um, uh, to the classics or reading, watching, listening to the work of other artists who respond to the classics, it's always incredibly exciting to see new perspectives um, and completely fresh responses to that body of literature and myth and we're in for a massive treat today because we have four poets reading um you are uh, for those of you who are watching this um live thank you very much for being here for those of you who are watching it on catch up as it were thank you for taking the time to enjoy the work and if you do please um share it with others. So our first poet today uh, is the uh, ever brilliant Nora Nadjarian. Nora is an award-winning poet and writer from Cyprus. She's won prizes or been commended in gazillions of international competitions, including the Plough Poetry Prize, the Orbis Poetry Competition, Poetry on the Lake, and most recently she was um, in the Live Canon International Poetry Competition 2020. Her work's been included, among others, in A River of Stories, an anthology of tales and poems from across the Commonwealth, in Being Human, the Blood Axe publication, absolute staple of my bookshelf, um, in Capitals, which came out from Bloomsbury, in the Stony Thursday book, which came out in 2018, and in Europa 28 from Comma Press. She was chosen to represent Cyprus in the Hay Festival's Europa 28 Visions for the Future in October 2020. Her latest books, the collection of short stories Selfie, which came out from Roman Books in 2017. She also facilitates creative writing workshops and she has um, uh, worked with many festivals and organisations, including the Chapman Poetry Festival, to deliver workshops. I am absolutely delighted she's here reading for us today and sharing some of her work inspired by the classics. Over to Nora. Thank you, Helen, for that wonderful introduction. And I'd like to thank Live Canon and the APGRD Research Center for this invitation. It's a great honor to be here. Um, so I'd like to start with one of my uh, personal favorites. And it's a poem called Nausicaa, Nafsika to the Greek speakers. And it was shortlisted in the Live Canon Poetry Competition in 2020. And um, it was inspired by the scene where Nozika uh, meets or sees Odysseus for the first time as she and her handmaidens are washing their clothes just as the shipwrecked hero appears. Nozika. I handed him the sea steep sheet I'd been washing and as he covered himself with it, and it clung to his body like skin. I knew I'd done what a sculptor does with marble, making him my own. His salt stung eyes and smiles searched my face. This is how the story began, with the sea as backdrop surging. Under my closed lids is another story. All night, the dampness of his long hair washed with olive oil I can taste. Wear this, I say, wear this and kiss him, my lips like a fish, drinking him in. I gave him food and wine, let him sleep in the guest bed I stripped on the day he set sail. That sheet I carried once more to the shore immersed it in loss, did what a sculptor does with marble, made it one with my naked body. Did you tell her about me? The sea took you as far back as I can remember.
Love Triangle, Cressida. Even the mattress reproaches me. Will you accept that every room has corners and secrets? Parts of me you do not know. I did love you, or I do. I sit at the edge of the bed and wait for him the way I once waited for you. In war, men move into myth and leave women's names behind. I wrote to you long letters I didn't send or sent, you ripped. The moment I gave myself to him is still the taste of ink in my mouth. Troilus, contentment and exhilarating wine, then betrayal and a dark place. Around me was all war and then came a twist in my heart. Before leaving her look, was a long, intricate carpet leading into strange, shuttered rooms. False, false, the melting inside and the tears I shed. I wanted to smash the chandelier into all its pieces. I am still not used to what I know. Diomedes. Some wars are fought over women, and this, open your eyes, was one of the best. She flirted with me, long hair, fast hands, how could I not? The beautiful delusion consummated on the same night. Oh, I shall have you again, fervent lady. As we plunge into the crash and thump of water, the dizziness of two bodies hold on tight. When I knocked him off his saddle, he fell in slow motion. The black stallion galloped towards you, jubilant. The next two poems were inspired by Sappho. The second and shorter poem was in fact inspired by the painting by Charles Auguste Mangin, 1877. Fragments. This complete body, a man, though still a boy. Come closer to me, my song, both violent and tender. I kiss your name and I tremble, Phaon, the sun, a coin. I burn, I peel with excess of women too, but you, through you I feel my body in pieces, torn segments of fruit. What is it that sets me free if not your pulse, this tremor? Liquid and pleasure, sweet seeds, a myriad of poems and no shame. I want you to live in me, feeding. I follow you into my veins. These words I write, I tear. You left me blank. You have gone and your boat a phantom, a liar made of salt. It is dark between living and knowing. I open the door to the sea. Sappho. After Sappho by Charles Auguste Mangin, 1877. The love, sing it one day if you can. The sea, wide, open, swallowed. Go home, taste of waves in your mouth. Clutch your heart, do, do not weep. Return home voiceless, doorbell and nothing. Pretend you have plenty, that it is enough. 
the poem happens in black, miscarried, the liar, broken, wasted, killed. Um, this final poem was in fact commissioned by Helen for a previous event, um, and it's called Pindar Forgot to Mention. Fury forced and torn my body, a bruised cherry I pick up and carry, destroyed in my hand. All that shame smeared on my small palm, pine needles to stitch me up in this godforsaken place. Red-lipped, heart-tied, my thoughts hemorrhaging, while Zeus sucks on the pip, while Zeus spits pip out, licks his lips and flicks channels. I am kept awake by teeth in my womb nine months. The gnawing child draws it out of me, that knowledge of offense, sniffing it in the walls like a puppy off the street, mongrel hungry, flayed to its bones. It pushes the foul foam back up my mouth to wretch at the memory of life gone wrong, sticking to my gums. From my darkness, a thousand hours, your head emerged perfect, your first breath piney, Protogenia and son doing well, wrote Pindar. Thank you. Thank you for what was an absolutely fabulous reading. I much appreciate it. It was amazing to get to hear you read that final poem uh, live. It was indeed commissioned by Live Canon as part of a project um, looking at Pindar in performance, um, where we commissioned 13 female writers to give voice to 13 of the pretty much silent women in Pindar who um, don't get a chance to say much for themselves. If you're interested in um, uh, taking a look at that, uh, the video of the whole event, Old Victories, New Voices, is on the Live Canon YouTube channel. Um, where Nora's poem appears along with 12 others. Um, thank you so much for such a rich reading and for responding to such a wide uh, array of the characters from Greek mythology. I first became really familiar with um, Nora's work back in 2020 um, when we published one of her poems in the Live Canon anthology. And since then, it's been um, an enormous joy to me to discover more and more of it and her amazing ability to take a contemporary perspective and engage with uh, ancient myth with such freshness and lyricism. So um, thank you. And I hope uh, we get to read lots more going forward. Um, our second poet today, um, I'm absolutely delighted to introduce um, is Michelle Penn. Now I've got a confession to make, which is I've had a sneak preview of Michelle's reading because um, on a Thursday evening last week, we had a, a live event, a live canon live event, uh, the first live reading for quite some time because of um, uh, lockdown and all things. And uh, one of our poets unfortunately was unwell and had to cancel and I looked around the audience and I thought who could I make leap up on stage um, at the very last minute and I saw uh, Michelle in the audience and um, invited her to give a sneak preview of today's reading uh, live last week but that just uh, serves to show how much of a treat you are in for because um, she read these uh, poems to an absolutely 
spellbound audience um her voice is so unique and striking and it's always such a pleasure to engage with her work um michelle's pamphlet self-portrait as a diviner failing won the 2018 paper swans prize and her book length poem paper crusade is coming out in 2022 from arachne press I'm so excited about that coming out. Um, so please keep that on your radar, everybody. Um, her recent poetry has appeared in PN Review, Tentacular, the Amsterdam Quarterly, the Rialto and the Interpreter's House. And she's got work coming up in London Magazine, Bad Lilies and Stand. Um, she curates innovative poetry, art and music crossover events in London as part of Corrupted Poetry. Um, but today she is here to read for us uh, some work inspired by um, classical myth. And I'm absolutely delighted to hand over to Michelle. Thank you, Helen. Um, it's such a pleasure to be here. And thank you to the APGRD for inviting me as well. Um, I'm going to read two poems. Uh, the first one is um, inspired by Icarus, and it's a multi-part poem called Icarus Was Misunderstood. I know this. I too was the child of a human god given wings, plush feathers and tiny hinges clacking softly in wind. Wings, not strapped to the back, but fitted onto each arm, enclosing it, grafted tight. My father wanted me to have easily what came to him through pain. Awkward holes cut into clothes, Kids at school jeering as I dragged into view, as I tried to fold my wings around desk and chair. Vanished to stand at the back of every class. Winters were terrible, snow collecting on the feathers. The smallest tip of the arms and ice slid inside my scarf, melting, slinking. Rain was worse, wings doubling in weight, dripping along the fresh floors of friends' houses. I wasn't invited again. Summer sweat, feathers chafing, angry nodules where the stitches riddled my skin. Yes, I could dive from high rocks and rise, collect the sky. Yes, I could glide like light and touch down without breaking stride. He asked every night how far I'd flown what I'd seen, achieved. He asked my wings. Time is an arrow, not a wheel. You must always move forward, aim higher. Don't you dare look back, not to those days pre-wing. You were monstrous then. He never asked if I wished for wings. He told me I wanted them and so I did. Wings unbreakable, the finest technology he could create. He measured and adjusted, convinced my silhouette would fuse with the sun. Before my wings, I couldn't imagine weight. Before my wings, I'd flutter my arms in secret, jump from slight hills, picture myself airborne, a rare bird capped with grace. Before my wings, I thought flight was a marvel of the arms, not ever guessing how it cramps the back, strains the stomach, constricts the lungs, how the head aches from reading fickle winds, dodging pockets of weather and my own doubt. He barely taught me, a few practice flaps then a plunging cliff, and no choice but to crouch onto air and trust. Kids threw rocks to bring me down. I flew closer to the clouds, the plains, skies shivering in my wake. Fear was a bead I didn't dare drop. Sky is much colder than ground. No one told me that. And my feathers aren't waterproof. They aren't warm. At night, I have no blanket. I tug my wings around my torso to sleep. Wings are a gift. I am aware of this. They are only granted to those who will use them well. Icarus was misunderstood. 
His father sent him skyward, failed him with meltable wax. My father made no such mistake. I've learned that people never actually touch. What we sense as touch is one magnetic field repulsing another. Contact is pushing away, just as flight is least of all a, question, a quest for motion. I'm going to read one more poem, uh, which is based on the myth of Orpheus and Eurydice, and it's called The Turning. They say the body remembers, his body remembering her a step behind. The single path, that midway point between deepest stillness and upper air, yet he couldn't hear, not her feet, not her breath, as though she'd already returned to water, to the single drop that birthed her. He'd intended to obey, the knots were so strict, do not turn, do not seek out her face. He held the words close to his chest, warm armor, easy music. The path changing, becoming less underworld and more world. He imagining emergence from that mushy dark into spirit and movement, operation and precision, day and daily life fused together, a steel wedding dress. The path changing, petrifying beneath her feet, urging her toward the moment they would surface as after a bomb, climb out through collapsed houses, back to ravage and fire, not even a single field clinging to green. Do not turn, not while you still sojourn below. She followed him, followed the path, debris rough at her heels, tang of metal dusting her tongue, blasts ahead imposing themselves on silence, ambulances, glass fracture, and cries. His breath a low hum to calm her, perhaps, or himself. She could have done anything to make him. She could have swallowed another world butterfly, or, or sung as though sickness were forcing the tune, separated herself into voices, distracted him with her shattering, perhaps staged a stumble, feigned a leg that could carry no weight. She could have done anything to make him, but she waited, waited, and the turning, late darkness, yet she saw it, the light of his torch as it bore toward her, one moment between shoulder and eye, the turning and the knowing he dug to the bottom of a shadow to find only himself. Thank you very much. Thank you, Michelle, for such a glorious reading. Um, it's absolutely spellbinding. The lyricism in the storytelling is um brilliant and your amazing ability to combine the really specific image with the enormous global statement is absolutely uh, breathtaking. Thank you so much. Um, I know those are poems that lots of us would like to come back to over and over again and unpick and uh, explore. There's so much richness in that. Um, but I'm so glad to have just got to hear you read them live uh, today so thank you for the second time i got the treat again so thank you um it's really really appreciated and um and i'm hoping that um a new dialogue with the apgrd will encourage you to write much more inspired um by the classics broadly whatever we might mean by that but it feels like there's um something um alchemical brewing there in your work that comes back so fundamentally to to myth and to um, icons and to real fundamentals of storytelling that hopefully this will be very exciting going forward. So thank you so much. Um, and now uh, what a treat, I get to introduce another brilliant poet today. Um, who is in fact a poet and writer from Oxford and um, uh, like myself has the privilege of sort of straddling the camp of poetry and academia and um, in fact, gave the APGRD Classics and English Lecture in uh, 2018, which is a lecture which brings together English literature and the classics and uh, and looks at 
the ways in which uh, English literature responds so richly to um, ancient text and myth. Uh, ben Morgan is a poet, uh, a writer, and his first poetry pamphlet, Medea in Corinth, Poems, Prayers, Letters and Accursed, was published by Poetry Salzburg. It retells the story of Medea in an incredibly um, textually rich way through a mixture of found text, poems, dramatic interludes, songs. It's so richly uh, intertextual and so impressive and extraordinary in the way that it uses form. Um, it's a really exciting text and, and you can get hold of it. It is published by Poetry Salzburg and I'd massively encourage you to do so. He's published widely in magazines um, and online all over the place, but today I'm absolutely delighted that he's here and he's going to share uh, some work with us. So over to Ben. Thank you. Thank you so much. Can you see me? <laughs> Yes. <laughs> well, thanks. Um, well, that's thank you so much for asking me along today. It's such an honour and it's so wonderful to be in this company of poets. So thank you for that. Um, I will be reading poems from Medea in Corinth. And if I have time, I'll finish up with an unpublished poem about a different myth, Medusa. Um, if, if I have time to get there, that would be great. Um, this collection is called Medea in Corinth because obviously Corinth is a place where in the story Medea really doesn't want to be and uh, she's not happy there. She's uh, abandoned by her husband obviously for the daughter of the Corinthian king and this poem finds her on the beach in Corinth uh, reflecting on her sort of emotional and political choices I suppose what's left to her to choose and it's called Beach. Now should be the time for compassion now I stand on the beach like an outcast, country seeker, walking the salt bridge between lands. The sunlight sharpens the day's wreckage, the shell's low gape, the ambergris, the fugitive runnels of weed. Behind them, the ocean, Hecate's gown, disturbed by the unwelcome touch of the sun, folds into hillsides and channels. Nature herself is afraid of the day that is coming. Nature wants to hide her face in the sheet of the night. Now my heart should grow moist as an eye for the driftwood forest that grows in the ocean, the dancing contest of the drowned. But I wish I too had settled in the sea, not in my husband's company. I could have learned those slow arabesques that are crowned with the laurel of seaweed. I too could have slept on the bed of shipwreck, supple and forgetful as a lover. Instead, I am beached here in Corinth, dry-eyed and jealous. I turn my face to the eye of the sun. Grandfather Helios, see where I stand, black candle without a flame. Behind me stands the palace of my enemies, sleet-hearted cowards who have never left home, strangers to hunger, as careless as they are fat. Show them that the islands of this ocean are teeth in the head of a great cat, how the world angers itself, longs to consume its own children. Show them with a cruelty that banishes their innocence what it is to be foreign. Show them what it is to lose your home, to look back down the flower candled pathway which leads to your own door and see it darken. I was very interested in the process by which Medea created the magical wedding dress which kills her love rival, Creusa. And um, I was also very interested in the instrument, the warp weighted loom, which is actually a ne Neolithic instrument that we do have examples of that Medea might well have used. And I sort of wanted to bring together these interests in the practicality and the magic of the process. Uh, and this is, poem describes the process of making the wedding dress and it's called Loom. Her flaxen hair hangs sweetly on the bowers of her body. In the half light, she whispers her colors. Beside me, Athene, brow of lightning, eyes turbulent seas. Owl of Olympus, Zeus's daughter, bless my labor. But the sun of her face swings away like a traveler's light. Silver threads lie across white, a delicate, furious balance. Creusa will glow like a lioness walking at night. My third hand dusts the fibers, golden, strange pollen, orbiting the dress. 
I do tell the story in order in this collection. So we move through the first outrage, uh, which is the murder at the wedding, obviously to her relationship with her children. And this poem is about that. And it has the, the name um, of her sons, Murmuros and Ferries. Our boys sleep differently. Did you know that, Jason? Did I ever tell you that back in the days of our closeness? Would you have thought it important? Would you have scanned it for omens? That Murmuros sleeps on his front, dangling short legs and arms as if he fell there. He looks like a lively corpse. He looks like an actor dying in fun. His hair is in tangles this morning, catching the gold from the sun. He is a heart catcher, Jason, the kind who will kill when he's young. Ferries is serious, dense in himself, gathered in like a bulb awaiting spring. He sleeps like he'd sleep in the earth, body a loop, a bright ring. It was difficult to build up to the climax of the story because it's such an impossible act to imagine in so many ways. Um, so what I wanted to do was to turn to other um, kinds of form and I got very, that might sort of support me in the process of writing it. And I got very interested in curse tablets. Uh, I thought that that's why there's the subtitle poems, prayers, letters, and a curse. So this, um, this is one of the last poems before the climax of the story. And uh, it is the curse. It's called Curse. Father of my children, know that I hate you. I will write it in your flesh, the hate that loves you. I will mark its tangents and its arguments without neglecting its essentials. I will steal your eyes, your jewels, the first secrets of your heart, the gold gush of your loins, your sweets, your children. I will lay down my soul and my young womb. The flowers of my life grown in the garden of my body with their milky movements and their sunbright eyes, I will blow their hearts out like candles. I will end what I began. I will treat them not as children, but as gods of a foreign race, patrons of our enemies, as idols that, staring down our armies across the smoking orchards must triumph in our own blood or be burned. And this last poem that I'll read from this collection, um, again, I wanted to, in the aftermath of the, the main act of the story, I wanted to have something that maybe Medea could turn to for some kind of solace or grounding, because obviously she's displaced in almost every way from her life at this point. And I thought that she might have, given that she's a high priestess of Hecate, that she might have some temple scrolls on her person or with her. And this, um, this is one that I, I try to imagine. Um, it should be set to music and I can't do that. So the words have to do, unfortunately. Um, it's called Hecate's Song. Every man and woman is a world, and the world is a man and a woman. Every man and woman has a soul, and the world's soul is each man and woman. Every animal is given grace, beauty of movement and body, and every body's movement has animal grace, even speech and murder, inventions of mankind. You wonder, daughter, where your rage fits in. It is a little window made of fire. From your window, you watch the world in pain. Your gaze passes by the mothers and the children playing in their orchards of innocence and the old folk dozing in the sun. Let it turn to the rooms of blood and stone where your family's story is written. I am there already. I will meet you. Thank you very much. Thank you. You tantalizingly told us that you might have one more poem for us, do you? I do if you'd like it, if you have time. 
Of course we'd like it. You, you can't tantalise us with uh, the idea of new work and uh, and then not read it. We've absolutely got time. Um, that would be absolutely marvellous, Ben. Um, well, I shall just find it in here. Um, it's, uh, it's actually spoken by Perseus um, in later life, having uh, killed Medusa and become king of Mycenae and married Andromeda. Um, all those things that the, the head of Medusa allows him to do. I was trying to imagine how he might look back on uh, his life as an old man uh, and what his relationship, I always wondered what, did, what became of the head of Medusa, what did, would he have done with it? Um, so that's what this is about. It's called Perseus Looks Back. I no longer keep you in the state rooms where you hung blindfolded, a fatal chandelier, my sceny glowing reckless bronze behind you, though the glint of your red locks and still fresh neck brought every mercenary to his knees. It was the mottled fraying bandage on your eyes and the way its tendrils brushed your upper lip as if into wakefulness or joy. Sometimes when everyone had gone, Andromeda, the courtiers, the slaves, I would blow out every candle in the room. Your ruined moon, lit up my empty kingdom. And I would stand below you, face upturned, as if the grey green light were water drops and the dreamer inside me were thirsty. Tonight I sit down beside you, my hand, the glad hand of a diplomat, no warrior now, against your lips. If you have something you want to say to me, the word you never spoke that day on Sarpedon, beneath the pallid double of the sun. Say it now, as I pull aside the gauze and see you at last, entirely. Thank you. Thank you. Um, and for that extra treat at the end, it's incredibly, um, uh, what extraordinary vivid um, poem. And what an incredible question, what happened to the head? Um, uh, I'm sure it didn't end up in the fridge as per the Uma Thurman um, Percy Jackson version. So um, where did it end up? And um, thank you so much for sharing that with us. Um, it's always a real treat to get to hear new work. But um, as Ben said, the rest of the poems come from um, his book published by Poetry Salzburg. So please do get your hands on that. Um, and uh, I think for all of us, it's just so exciting to look at the way that all those different forms, um, the, the poetic, the lyrical, the cursed tablets all come together, the found poetry to build a story and to allow us to um, contemplate what is absolutely unimaginable as you say Ben it's so difficult to really engage with such a, a story of such enormity and such trauma and actually um, somehow um, all those different forms allow us to sort of scaffold towards it and to take that brave step so thank you for such a brilliant book and for sharing it with us today um, and now we come to our fourth and uh, final poet, who I am always absolutely delighted to introduce. Um, I confess I may have been slightly uh, guilty for steering uh, Tessa Foley towards the classical. As an enormous fan of her work, which contains something so elemental and, and anthemic, there are so many Tessa Foley poems you want to get emblazoned on a t-shirt. Um, I've uh, always encouraged Tessa to look to myth and now she's building um, an extraordinary body of work that responds to the classics and I'm unbelievably delighted she's agreed to sort of share that work in progress with us today. For anyone not familiar with uh, Tessa Foley's work, she uh, her work explores many themes but principally um, feminism, sexuality, rejection of normalcy as she puts it. Um, her first collection Chalet Between Thick Ears was published in 2018. It's also inspired a series of live canon films. Uh, the same year 2018 Tessa published um, Garden which is illustrated by her sister Anna Foley um, and that book raised money for the Portsmouth Abuse and Rape Counselling Service which is where Tessa had volunteered for three years. Her second collection what sort of bird are you? I haven't have a copy of it next to me, so I'm holding it up in front of you. Um, there, what sort of bird are you? With, which also has incredible cover illustration by uh, Anna Foley. If I turn it over, you can see the beautiful artwork on the back as well. Um, that launched in lockdown. Uh, Glyn Maxwell, who's recently chaired uh, the Elliot Prize, uh, wrote of this book, a few poets are original 
A few are distinct, a handful are sad, some wise, some funny. I can't think of any recent English poet who's arrived with so much of this already blazing. Tessa Foley is a brilliant and unmistakable poet in whose hand the language is pure glistening matter. Um, what an incredible quote, but it's absolutely true that um, Tessa has an amazing ability to take stories and reform them into something that sparkles and shines in a completely different way. And so I'm absolutely delighted to invite her to read some of her work in progress that riffs off the classics. Over to Tessa. Hello, good afternoon. Thank you for having me, Helen. Um, it's been fantastic hearing Ben and Nora and Michelle, and I'm really thrilled to read alongside them. So um, I'd like to start with a poem uh, about Daphne, who Apollo was so desperately in love with that he wouldn't leave her alone when she told him she wasn't interested. She was that uninterested, she didn't just make up an imaginary boyfriend or give him the wrong contact details like some of us have. Um, she begged to be turned into a tree, which she was, a laurel tree. So this is called Daphne's No. From the graceful bounce of her branch, her stance in the spinney, her sway in the breeze. She must have been flirting, showing too many leaves. Out of all of the trees, she is beautiful first. Her shivering no makes it the worst yes he's heard in all of today. So she says she'd rather be lashed by her roots to the earth than go out with him. The shake of refusal visible from Olympus, rattling the sparrows that sing in her limbs. And he hears a straightforward and modest acceptance, the freshness of fluttering green in her fear. But he hears what he hears. He declares that it's love, a love unbecoming, an unbearable longing, and he's endlessly songing, lyre on his knee, tunes pledging his sex to the trunk of a tree. And with this, she is stripped of her parts and possessions, his presence still clinging in her ambering sap, her little twigs snapped and sold off as tiaras for poets and throwers, and it's still about love. A love only existent in lines of defence, for truly a prince or even a god is no match for the sorcery hid deep in denial. Though she refuses, he fells her with axe. That sound between wax is her still saying no. Um, this next one is about Cyrene. It's someone else that Apollo fell in love with. Um, but amazingly, this time he was impressed by her strength when she wrestled a lion. Um, but it wasn't sure he should marry her. So he should ask, he asked her advice of uh, Chiron. This is called Cyrene's Strength. She was not one for what they so naively call a womanly pursuit. No weaving, waiting tables, wine dining with the girls. Rather, she would strike or swing or snarl at any, every enemy of the herd and spar with beef opponents, bronze javelin at their chins. The winds utmost important, so little did she sleep, alert until deep into hours she'd neatly take her rest. Impressed by reputation and no stranger to the wrestles, Apollo travelled leagues, intrigued to see a lion in her bare palms pinned her arms of might and governance. Clearly struck, he called to ears his gentle four-legged foster boy and marvelled loud to Curran. Here on the slides of Mount Pelion's reach, I never thought to find the god immortal. I never thought to seek. Can you see her vanquished kings? Strength springs eternal through her blood, her direct vision, bold ambition, her mind, it is not shaken with the bitter wind of fear. Which human could have raised her? Which sycamore shed this key? Darkly grown under the mountains, she fountains boundless brave. And save me, tell me all is fair and just. When do as I must, I touch her with my godly hands. I am not just a man, but man, she makes me feel as though I'm low beneath her weight. And Kyron clapped his hooves and laughed. You're asking me? You ask? Will you not be blushing when you call her to your room and groom this mortal woman into loving like a god? You've got all kinds of knowledge, Dad. You're mad for knowing all the many millions of fishes in the sea. You know the tree and all the leaves it sheds and grows in turn. Now learn about strong women. 
And my last poem is about the uh, well-known myth of Persephone, the uh, child who was abducted by the god of the underworld, because he fell in love with her. And she's um, often thought of just a pretty girl playing with flowers. So I, I thought perhaps her fascination with flora might be a scientific one. Her plans for life then um, ruined by this great polluter. This is called Persephone's Voice. See this tiny star untwirling in my lineless hand. I hold this to the light, see deep into its crafted core and more. I am a student of the stigma and of seeds, the pollen, photosynthesis. I'm working now on how it is that these, the brightly coloured heads bursting underneath my eye, don't just look pretty in my hair. They share a sweetness remedy. With them, I dream of bringing science to my siblings of a fragile form. But as I brush the blades of grass and using glass to look a little closer still, into the spears of willow drops and up to tops Olympus heighted trees, under the trusting buzzing of the bees, by greedy and advantaged watch, I'm seen. As my self-teaching of the earth weaves in and out of possibility, I am unseasoned learning as I unlace the delicacies of inching life and lean upon my fragile wrist, I'm seen. On me fall the eyes that covet green, their wish to rip a years from ripe, pre-teen from the gardens and the fields. He who dulls our cleanest sunshine, fogs our clearest streams. The lilies dangling from my neck, it is believed, are flags of procurable chastity. Really, my unheaving breasts, ungrown limbs and many eaves before a body hair would be enough to show my fresh naivety. But still, he balls, smile, love, it might never be. He, a male who speaks inevitable destiny, though once I believed I might live life minus being robbed and raped, but no such fortune due to father who is God and his brother playing aces for my fate. Beauty is the word, they say, at me, a child bride. That youth is their commodity, a tree to fell. No, tell him, please, that isn't me. I am a bud with dreams to be nature's ally and her analyst. What I could be if these great deal-making fists leave me free. But they prize my body and the earth so high and are digging deep to crack us both, strip us of our parts to decorate their halls. I would just like to be me and free with other girls and natural world and to create, invent, be the bee, spread the pollen, my remedies, to soothe the fits of sisters in their birth. I scream like them when they dragged in, in trade beneath my dearest earth. I inspire the plated fruits that he now grasps and tries to use to taint my taste. He takes because he lacks himself, though given every open window, he is spoiled and often chooses still to the break. And he teaches thousand years of sons to take and take for greed's sake. I swear they will not want me down there in this maze. The scales and spiders of the walls will wither beside the hell I'll make. A god and robber's arm across my throat. I plan my biggest mind escape. He rapes my poor unblossomed shape. But while I'm laying in this, his weak as death and rotten iron grasp, I am hand-stitching what I name daffodils. I forge to orate, and thinking seven brand new ways to use the lily to treat or to create. And as for pomegranate seeds, no god or monster will dictate what Persephone should eat, or if she should lose weight. Thank you. Thank you, Tessa, uh, for such a brilliant um, and blistering reading. Thank you very, very much. Um, it's uh, always such a pleasure to hear your unique voice and lyricism and uh, incredible um, facility uh, with language, all the um, 
uh, everything that was riffing through that and every level of its rhyme, its internal rhyme, its uh, the um, uh, amazing observations of how we use language in our culture and our society. And to see all of that engaging with classical myth is just um, such a pleasure. So thank you very much for sharing that with us. And I hope you'll keep us in touch with where that goes um, and that seam of work and how it develops. And hopefully this is the beginning of a dialogue with uh, the APGRD and everything it has to offer in terms of um, uh, researching and thinking about all of those stories. So thank you so much. Um, before I come to thanking all four poets for this reading today, um, uh, just following up on the idea of where things go, um, a little bit of a flashback to the second of the readings in this series where we um, had some work in progress from uh, Mehmet Isbadak, and he read some poems he was working on about the Minotaur, and I thought you'd just be delighted to know that those are now published um, in this rather uh, brilliant book, um, The Urban Minotaur by Mehmet Isbadak. Um, so if you enjoyed his reading back in the second of the readings in this series, those poems are now available for you to get your hands on. It's an absolutely extraordinary book, which um, riffs off the idea of the Minotaur uh, living currently in Brixton and trying to negotiate the maze that is Brixton and modern life. And it's an extraordinary book. And we're very proud to have heard some of it in this series on its journey towards publication. So thank you everybody for joining us today. We've heard four incredible poets and I want to take this opportunity to say a massive thank you to Nora, to Michelle, to Ben and to Tessa for sharing work old and work new and work in progress and being part of this conversation between contemporary writers and the classics and between Live Canon and the APGRD. It's massively appreciated. We're hoping to keep this series going and going forward. Um, so if there's any work we should know about, anything in progress that we should be aware of, do get in touch with me and tell me. It's always an absolute delight to know what people are working on and how we might be able to help or support that process. So thank you very much again to Nora, Michelle, Ben and Tessa and to all of you who are watching. It's been an absolute pleasure. Thank you. <laughs>